Hi, this is Pat Ruggles, and we are starting our Poverty Now seminar for this week. This week's speaker is Dr. Heidi Hartman. She is the founder and past president of the Institute for Women's Policy Research in Washington. And she's currently also the distinguished economist in residence for the gender and economic analysis uh, on the topic of gender and economic analysis at American University and the editor of the Journal of Women, Politics and Policy. She's uh, written very extensively on topics relating to um, women in the labor force and uh, the economic status of women. And uh, she uh, has, uh, is extremely well known in the field and we are very happy to have her with us. She's the, she was the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship in 1994 for her pioneering work in the field of women in economics. And uh, she is a graduate of Swarthmore College and Yale University. So uh, here you go, Heidi. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at um, UT Austin again. I think I've visited in person once before. I hope to get a, another chance to come see you all again. Um, it's uh, also wonderful to be included in this lecture series. Uh, obviously, women, poverty, and employment is a very uh, important topic and a hot topic right now, as we've all been reading about how women uh, are being impacted in this particular uh, recession, which is um, primarily the result of the shutdown from the pandemic. Um, and uh, it's had a lot of effects on women, which we we'll, can talk about, and which I'm happy, you know, if we have a, a good discussion about it. Um, I did prepare some background slides, so I'm, I'm going to start with those. Um, I want to point out that, um, and I know this is part of a series, so you all may already know this, but uh, poverty is higher in the United States than in other similarly wealthy countries, and it's primarily because we distribute less of our overall national income to the poor through government programs. We have 34 million poor people in the U.S. This was at the end of 20. Uh, 19, the most uh, recent Census Bureau report covers the year 2019, and that's 10.2 percent of our population. Also, our measure of poverty is very low. So if we were using measures comparable to what other rich countries use, we would have an even higher rate. And their rate is typically around 4 or 5 percent, but based on a much higher measure. So uh, we really are not doing very well by our poor overall. Also, I could say that our labor market does, I think, produce more inequality than in some of these other rich countries because our minimum wages are very low and we don't have uh, labor unions and collective bargaining that can uh, raise wages for many workers uh, as happens in many other countries. It's pretty rare here. I think it's only about 8% of the US labor force now is in a labor union or has a union collectively bargain uh, for them. Uh, we also know that women and people of color exp experience a lot more poverty uh, because besides their low wages and discrimination, uh, the US has fewer family-friendly benefits than other countries. We don't have paid family leave um, as a national plan. We do, by the way, have eight states that are giving paid family leave benefits. And um, some of those states, it's up to 12 weeks now. Some of the other states are in four weeks still. And the majority, vast majority of states don't have any paid leave. We did get some paid family leave in the coronavirus emergency legislation that passed in March, and some people were able to take advantage of that. We also have some subsidized child care and some subsidized elder care, but not enough. I mean, of all the low income families that are eligible for subsidized child care, something like 15% of the families actually manage to get it because there's not enough money to go around. And then we also lack universal paid sick days. When, this is one of the things that I find that uh, students from other countries are the most amazed about when they find out, well, you get sick, you have a car accident, you might be out of work for a month or two, what do you do? And they say, well, live with your family, borrow money from friends. There's nothing for many people in many jobs, there's nothing. And uh, people from other countries are really shocked by that because just like they have national health insurance, they have a national sick leave plan that will replace your income when something happens to you. It's nice to see your cat, but Pat. Yeah, <laughs> a slight interloper there. <laughs> well, one thing that we economists like to talk about is how poverty is related to recessions. And, um, and these two graphs, which again come from that most recent Census Bureau report, the, the dark gray vertical areas are the recessions. And we can see that the number of 
in poverty tends to go up during a recession or just after a recession and then tends to fall. Now the top, uh, top half of the graph shows the population in millions. So of course our population is growing. And so it looks like we have more poor people, which we do because we're a growing population. If you look at the lower half, you can see that our poverty rate is falling. And in fact, with this very long growth period uh, since the last recession, uh, our poverty rate is, is the lowest that we've measured uh, since the beginning of the, the beginning of the series. And um, by the way, Professor Ruggles is an expert on the, the measure of poverty and everything about its history. So I'm not going to go into that. But so we were doing pretty well because we had a long growth period. And uh, now I am looking to advance another slide here. And uh, I always think that the reasons for women's poverty is very, very simple. Um, we know that women earn less than men for the same and similar jobs, but we also, uh, and, and that means that if you're you know, living only on your own wage, you're single, you don't have family money, it means just by statistical definition, more of you will be poor because the definition of poverty is the same for men and women. And um, if you have, on average lower wages, there'll be more people on the bottom for women than there are for men and that will happen. In general, um, women also work uh, in different jobs than men and that's uh, when they also earn less in those different jobs. So many people have argued that those jobs are comparable and that they should be paid more and that they're simply underpaid because, because women do them. An example might be uh, nursery school teaching. Um, nursery school teachers often make less than who are typically women make less than parking lot attendants who are typically male, for example. And so uh, it's not just in the same job you can earn less, it's in different jobs that you earn less. Even when we know from many young women today know that they are more educated than their peers, than their male peers. And yet they're making less than the men and they don't understand why. And it's because this is baked into our wage system that the undervaluation of the type of work that women tend to do. Women also, however, work fewer years and, and hours per year. So you look at a 15 year period or a five year period or a 20 year period, women will have some years out of the labor market more than men do and they'll work fewer hours. And it's generally because of family care responsibilities. they have their children, their spouses when they're ill, their elderly parents. And if they're not sharing income with a higher earner to keep your family income up, then you are at increased risk of poverty because you are taking care of other people. And this goes to the fact that it's actually women who have the children and raise the children most often. Yes, we have uh, some men raising uh, children on their own, uh, particularly uh, people who adopt children. Uh, but for women who do raise children on their own, they often do it without financial help from any partner. And uh, this again will, will raise your poverty level. So I, I like to tell women that having children is a risk it can be very rewarding, very enjoyable, um, but it is a financial risk. And of course, all of these issues can be addressed by public policy. And uh, we're gonna you know, get to that um, at, at the end. Um, because of these lower wages of women and because of their greater responsibility for families and children, they do experience more poverty. So for children, it's not very different, slightly higher poverty rate for girl children. Uh, but for those in the ages 18 to 64, more women are poor than men. And for those 65 and older, uh, more women are poor than men. I, I'm now going to switch to a, an older graph, and I'm embarrassed by that. I didn't have a chance to update it. When you break out the age groups by um, five and 10 year ages down here at the bottom, you'll see that the young adults are poor. These are people 18 to 24 here. These are the women, the men, uh, 20 to 24, the women, the men. Uh, 30, 35 to 44, the women and the men. And then it's more equal. And I think a lot of that is because the women and men are more likely to be married to each other then. Um, and their children are grown or mostly out of the house. And then as we move into um, aging years, 60 and up, this is uh, 65 to 74, 75 plus, more women than men are poor again. So when you just look at age, um, without a, a, a big age group, without looking at these breakdowns, you don't see this uh, really very, very strong gender component of poverty. And again, I believe this is largely the result of family care in these years. And I like to say that in old age, everything you've done all your life comes home to roost. If you took time out 
you've got a lower pension. <laughs> and many women did that and their higher earning husbands die and the, as some of the assets might, might um, go away, you know, when, when, the, when the man dies, when the husband dies. This is a by family type and it will just show that um, for those in married couple families, I'm sorry, you can't see this, but you can get a copy of the deck and blow it up. Uh, married couples families, it's about 5% are poor, uh, whether or not they have children, but when they have children, it's 6%. And it's about the same for younger and older children, 6%. But if we look at female headed households, it's 24% poor for all of them. For those with children under 18, it's 37% poor. And for those with children under age six, it's 46% poor. So that's about half of female headed households with young children that are in poverty. And that is primarily because we simply do not have the paid family leave and the subsidized childcare that enables um, these women to work and to work at a job enough hours at, at decent pay. Uh, single men who, uh, who uh, run households with, with children without a spouse also are poorer uh, than other men. Uh, they're 16.3% poor if they have children under 18, and 18.4% 18 are poor with children under six, and 11% uh, overall if they're, they are in a family. Down at the bottom, we can see people without families, and those poverty numbers are quite high, 16.6% for men and 20.9% uh, for women. And I believe those have gone up. Uh, when I compare this to older data, those have definitely gone up, right, Pat? Yep. Yeah. And that's surprising. I think it has a lot to do with uh, the minimum wage simply not growing at all. It's still $7.25 an hour, which is ridiculous. Um, back in 1968, when it was its highest, it would have been worth over $10 in today's dollars. And um, that's about the time that I graduated from college. Uh, and those were boom years, actually. <laughs> um, and um, and unfortunately, the the labor market in which you graduate does tend to affect your earnings, uh, at least for quite a few years, quite a few of those early years. Uh, so I think uh, single adults are, you know, are having a harder time in this labor market than they used to, and that's something to be kept in mind. Um, I did mention that women earn less than men. It's actually made quite a bit of progress recently. We're now up to 82% of what men earn, or four-fifths. Uh, <laughs> that's about half of the wage gap uh, that when I started out in the labor market is gone. That is, when I was in the wage gap, when I was starting out in the labor market, it was about three-fifths. Women earned 60% of what men earned. Now it's 80, 82%. Look at that. Oh, great. Uh, yes, it's still a long way to go, but uh, it is some improvement. I, I mentioned that women earn less than men uh, in many jobs. It's actually in almost every occupation that we can measure that there's enough women and men in both jobs to measure. Out of a, several hundred, it's only like usually four or five a year where women earn more than men. And we've done a study at IWPR, the think tank where I still work part-time, uh, which I founded many years ago. Uh, that if women earn the same as similar men in terms of education level, the hours of work, their age, the region of the country, half of the poverty of families with working women would be eliminated. And we have very few, you know, policy levers that can wipe out half of poverty. Of course, it's not that easy to get women equal pay. So it's not a simple policy lever like increasing the EITC. But I think it's lost in the discussion of working women and poverty that, um, you know, just giving women equal pay uh, would, would really reduce poverty a lot. You can see that um, the high poverty rate for single mothers and their children would fall from 29% to 14%. So this is really very significant. And the number of children with working mothers who nevertheless are living in poverty would be nearly cut in half, dropping from uh, 5.6 million to 3.1 million. We did another study at IWPR where we did look at women's and men's earnings over a 15 year period. And it was really fascinating. I was really shocked at how much difference uh, because you know, labor economists who've been looking at women for the last many decades have just always emphasized how much more women are working. And we are, we're working more years of our lives, more hours a year getting more education, getting higher paying jobs. Nevertheless, uh, when we looked at the three different 15 year time periods between 1968 and 2015, 
um, women's earnings are still half of men's over a 15 year period. And, you know, some people think, well, that's no good. It includes part-time work and it includes years you didn't work. But if you want to ask yourself, you know, what does it take to live on in a, this kind of economy? Generally, if you're not self-employed or don't have family money, it requires a wage. And so if the typical woman is only taking out of the labor market and bringing home half of what uh, men get from the labor market, that really is a huge difference in how well she can support herself, what her long-term economic trajectory is, what her family's trajectory is. So I think that um, is, is, a, is a measure that more people should use. I have seen it used both in Canada and in England. Um, and it, it does give you a, a different view. We, we tend to look only at the full-time year-round workers, and that leaves out a lot of women, almost half, and uh, or more than half, and quite a few men. Uh, I think it leaves out about 35% of men, uh, if you want to look at it over 15 years. Um, and then in the uh, second, I also want to mention that, oh dear, where am I now? Uh, that uh, in the second period, we looked particularly at those who had low earnings every year. And 90% of those adults who had low earnings every year in a 15 year period uh, were women. And by the third period that fell to about 75%. And I think that speaks again to the low minimum wage and the extent to which men, particularly immigrant men are suffering from this very low uh, minimum wage in this period. So that more men now are in that group of long-term uh, low wage earners. And uh, in another study that I, I did with two co-authors, we took a look at what the requirements were in low-wage jobs. And we were shocked that they're pretty different. Their credentials for women in low-wage jobs are often quite significant. And there are very few men's jobs that, that are low-wage that require credentials. For women, it's in cosmetology, in home health care, in uh, various kinds of assistant nursing jobs, nursing aides. Um, and so a lot of, I think, what women do in the labor market is related to caring labor. It's undervalued at home and it's undervalued at work as well. And so, um, you know, many, much of the subsidies that we have for uh, our caring programs, child care, elder care, they do come from the federal government and some state governments, but they're not generous enough to really provide a, a, a decent wage for the largely women who are, who are doing the work. And as I mentioned before, women often do these jobs long-term and they have very little opportunity for advancement. And many of the women that are in these long-term low-wage jobs are immigrants or women of color. So it's, uh, the labor market is really producing a lot of uh, poverty uh, for women. And I, and I wanna turn now to the um, coronavirus impacts. We all know that there was huge unemployment in April. I mean, it was a, a graph like no economist had ever seen before in terms of how many jobs were lost instantly uh, when many businesses closed in response to the pandemic. And surprisingly, more women than men lost their jobs. And uh, as I, there is a lot of what we call job segregation, meaning that women and men work in different places in the labor market in different kinds of jobs women doing care and uh, service jobs, for example, to think about hotels, uh, cleaning all those rooms. Uh, retail jobs are relatively um, evenly uh, divided between women and men, but more of the essential retail jobs seem to have been done by men. And the ones that uh, started creeping up as people more and more spend time at home, we kind of know anecdotally that they started working on their houses. And so places like Home Depot, which employ more men, you know, grew in employment. So there were some sectors of the, the labor market that are male dominated, uh, such as fire and police, uh, other ones. Other essential jobs uh, are of course done by women, healthcare, um, supermarkets, again, e pretty equally divided between men and women. Childcare centers closed, that very much affected women workers. Uh, most of the schools that are public are still paying their teachers and their teachers are still working, you know, in a viral environment. But as the economy has tanked, um, the tax payments are going to go down and we expect to see layoffs among teachers and uh, uh, assistant teachers and uh, support personnel in school systems. It'll be very difficult for states 
and cities not to lay off teachers uh, if they don't get more federal aid. So that's one of the things that's happening in the Congress right now that's uh, potentially very disadvantageous uh, to, to women. Uh, also, we know that the long-term unemployed are growing, those who are not on temporary layoff. We um, also know that the additional unemployment benefits that were uh, came about in March through the special emergency relief, $600 a week in addition to what you get for regularly, uh, made a huge difference. Uh, many workers at all income levels were able to save some of that money, which is a good thing because now those benefits are gone and they're spending that money down. And so um, some by some studies that have been done of poverty, we usually measure poverty annually, but there were studies that measured it month by month. I've seen a couple of them. One pointed out that poverty actually fell um, in April and May and June because of these extra benefits. There was a stimulus payment of $1,200 for an adult, $500 for each child, and the $600 extra in unemployment and unemployment for self-employed people, for gig workers who aren't usually covered at all by unemployment. So all of these benefits you know, really came and most of them, the, those stimulus payments were one time and most of the unemployment benefits ended at the end of July. So now poverty is growing. So uh, several studies have shown that poverty is growing as a result uh, month by month uh, because of, again, these special benefits not being continued yet by Congress. Uh, I saw a survey reported on by CLASP, the Center for Law and Social Policy, also in Washington that uh, pointed out how many, um, I have to find that again to come up with that um, number, how, how many, uh, especially uh, people of color say that they, they know that they or someone in their house, household lost employment income due to the coronavirus. We know that many people of color uh, had jobs that were labeled as essential and they have continued to work exposing themselves to the coronavirus. And uh, some of them also lost jobs um, that were ended because of the virus. Others uh, may have become ill and lost some time. So it's uh, almost two thirds of uh, Latinx adults and uh, 57 percent of black adults and this was as of uh, mid-July and among those households with children three in ten black households say their children are experiencing food insecurity and one in four Hispanic households so even with one of our best programs food stamps also called SNAP we still have a lot of food insecurity and I think the number that shocked just about everybody uh, just came out in early October about the September labor market 800,000 women left the labor market in September. That means they're no longer unemployed. They're not looking for work. Uh, they have dropped out. And I have seen some estimates that people believe it will take five to 10 years for women to recover from the damage the coronavirus has done to women in the labor market. Uh, there's the elimination of childcare. Uh, virtual schools means, again, the elimination of childcare. Your children are not in school, they're home with you working on their computers. Uh, someone has to be watching them, most typically women. Various studies have shown that women are doing more of the um, online help to the children, to their children that are learning at home. And, um, and they're suffering that double burden more. I did read a pretty funny article about uh, several men who work outside their home in their cars in the driveway. Uh, because it's quieter. And so that means the women are home inside the house with the screaming kids possibly also trying to work. <laughs> now there is, I did read an article recently though about some good news about that, which is that um, um, that uh, for those men who are at home, there are couples where the, the men can be at home uh, because of the type of job they have and the wife has to go to work, let's say in healthcare. And those men are therefore now the primary caretaker of the children. And that could be a permanent change in the sense that um, once studies show that once men really get involved in childcare, they do tend to do more of it for years to come. And that's one of the arguments for paid family leave. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, so there are some bright spots. And then finally, I just wanna end with some policy ideas, kind of where I started. We need a more generous safety net. We simply don't have one in this country equal 
to the uh, social democratic countries abroad. Um, and we should have triggers for high unemployment, which we have, uh, but sometimes not robust enough and public health emergencies. This is not gonna be our last pandemic by any means, and it's not over yet. Um, better anti-discrimination enforcement in the labor market and more access to equal opportunity in education. I also um, added access to higher education and job training without debt, higher minimum wages. Uh, Australia has a system where they set minimum wages, not just one for the whole country, but in different occupations and they can set them higher depending on the skills required. That's a really good system when you don't have a lot of unionization or collective bargaining. So we could really benefit from that here. Um, I've said a lot about the more and better family friendly benefits. So you probably know that in other countries, paid family leave can be as long as a year. Six months is not uncommon. We're, our longest one is 12 weeks so far. And paid sick days can be almost indefinite. Um, ours is usually quite sure, short. We do have something like 12 or 15 states that have passed paid sick days, but they're often two to nine days a year. Whereas in most other countries, you know, it would go up to a year and more elder care. And I sometimes think we need to give people more cash. So there are always universal basic income grants or stronger tax credits. We have an earned income tax credit. It could just be a tax credit, whether or not you work. Um, that could go to lower income, low and moderate income families, for example, to support children. So a larger child care credit. So a lot of things we could do. And these are just some of the ideas. And I hope you'll all have lots of comments and questions that you would like to make. Thank you very much, Heidi. That was extremely interesting. Um, I do, of course, have lots of comments and questions because you know, I always do. But, <laughs> but uh, one of the, the questions I wanted to ask you is, uh, uh, as you, you were talking about the coronavirus impacts, um, and uh, there is, I, I've seen some recent evidence that um, it is, as you say, particularly affecting women's labor force participation. Um, do you think that's going to be a long-term issue? Well, I didn't think so. Um, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I've tended to assume that the labor market would go back the way it was. And one of the interesting things that happened after the 2007, 2008, 2009, great recession is that the advantage that men had in the number of jobs never returned. That is right. women crept equal to men during that recession and it varied a little bit, but they, they stayed much closer to men after the recession, coming back to equal again sometime within the last year, I think. Um, and I thought that that, I thought that women might drop you know, might drop back down and that women's job, men's jobs might pick up. Um, so that's an example of a change that lasted. And, um, you know, I think it's really hard to say. I think so much depends upon whether we solve the childcare and the, even the schooling problem, you know, we don't have great childcare in the summer or after school. Uh, other countries have better programs. The summer, they have a series of shorter vacations instead of one, 10 week vacation. And that seems to be easier to arrange alternative care apparently. Um, so I, I just think a lot of it has to do with that. It also has to do with the direction of the economy. If uh, Vice President Biden is elected and he's able to put through a large infrastructure program, something that uh, President Trump said he would do, uh, there could be a lot of construction jobs that would probably mostly go to men. Um, there also would be uh, infrastructure jobs, uh, you know, related to the new green economy that, that women can do and will do. Women have always been strengthened. Their employment has always been strengthened by healthcare and that those jobs should come back. I mean, what's been happening in the coronavirus, right, is that coronavirus is getting all the healthcare. People with other illnesses are just not seeing doctors not going to the hospital. Uh, and uh, so some healthcare jobs are actually reduced. Um, so the healthcare because of the aging population and because of continued you know, advances in medicine that people always want better health, we should continue to see that grow. And I think we'll see more men going into healthcare. We've certainly seen uh, more men going into the 
high level um, nursing with master's degree programs. Mm -hmm. In in the past, there's been some tendency for women who leave the labor force to have a hard time coming back. Certainly, we've seen a lot of women leave the labor force in uh, in this emergency, and uh, you know. So one of my concerns is uh, having to take on this this very large um, amount of you know second shift work. You might say mm -hmm. uh, for women, you know, as you mentioned, they're likely to be the people who are doing most of the online schooling. They're um, you know, they're filling in a lot at home when uh, when the sort of structure of society is, has broken down around things like childcare and school. Um, right. I guess this is a two part question. Do you see that being a short term versus a long term problem? Or um, and do you think this is going to affect? I mean, once having once you're out of the labor force, it's going to be hard to get back in. What's your what's your thinking around that? Well. Uh, it all depends on economic growth, right? I mean, yeah. if we have really, really strong economic growth, the strong economic growth tends to draw people in when you don't expect it. World War II, all those women, you know, drawn into all those formerly male jobs. So it really, a lot depends on economic growth, but if it's, you know, average economic growth, then I think, yes, it's gonna take a while for women to get back in, especially I think, you know, some of the more highly trained women who may have lost important skills during the time. I'm also wondering, I, I, I don't know, is this a, uh, showing my age again, a hippie moment? Are people <laughs> going to <laughs> decide that, you know, they don't have to go out and eat dinner that much. They don't have to go to the movies that much. They don't have to go to plays and travel on expensive vacations that much. Actually, you know, we can live on less and we can work less and we can consume less, you know, which would be a kind of ecological thing as well. We've seen some environmental advances during the coronavirus. Uh, fewer uh, emissions from automobiles, for example, certainly fewer emissions from airplanes. Um, so cleaner air. Uh, so if people are going to choose, you know, a more, um, a more uh, ecologically simple uh, lifestyle, uh, you know, less complex lifestyle, they're moving out of cities into the country. Um, then, then I think more people working at home and fewer people working, meaning more women doing the second job, the second shift type job is a real possibility. Uh, so I really, you know, I am concerned too. I, I really am not sure which way this economy is going to go. And I, it sounds like you have some of the same concerns, Pat. Yes, definitely. Um, as, as you mentioned, uh, a huge amount of what happens in the future for the low income population, whether they're women or men, depends on how much economic growth we see. And uh, with sort of complete failure to, of the Congress to get, get their act together to pass additional stimulus since the first uh, stimulus bill, um, I think we can anticipate that that will slow growth in the immediate future. Um, it's harder to know what will happen in the long term, but um, it's you know it's it's it seems likely at this point that we're looking at at least several more months before um, before we start to see substantial recovery for many families. Um, the Census Bureau has a recent report suggesting that uh, approximately twenty percent of kids are in families with food insecurity at this, during this coronavirus. Uh, yeah, that, that matches what, um, what I had for black and Hispanic families for which it's higher, yeah. Yep, and uh, you know, that's kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> you know, we got, we got a lot of families that are really suffering. And as you've pointed out, our social safety net is, you know, it's not set up for this at the best of times, but this is definitely not the best of times. Um, so, and, and those are families for whom, you know, every adult was already fully employed. They were either working or fully taking care of children. So, um, they don't have the luxury of saying, oh, I think I'll move to the country. Uh, and one of us can work less than we used to. Uh, that, that doesn't work, you know, yeah. uh, for low income families. And, uh, I, I think two things have to happen in the short run. 
Um, and they're both going to take several months. One is you to really open business, you have to have the virus under control. We, ha we have to have, you know, less contagion um, and hopefully eventually vaccines. But everyone says vaccines is going to take at least six to nine months. So we want that period to be shorter. The more control we can get out of the virus, you know, the more careful opening we can do mm -hmm. or reopening as the case may be. So that's number that the Congress did enact in March. I don't know if you could hear all that. My internet might have gone out, but. We got most of it. <laughs> okay, so those, those are, you know, preconditions. And uh, seeing a recent op-ed by um, Jared Bernstein and I believe Dean Baker about how the, deci the budget hawks are going to come back the public policy professionals who believe that we can never borrow money, we can never go into debt, and we have too much debt already. There's no evidence that we have too much debt already. Nobody is not buying bonds uh, from the US. Uh, interest rates are low, the cost of borrowing is low, and uh, it's not clear that we have too much debt. And if we don't have that debt, instead of having a, another, you know, a recession that lasts six months to a year, more, it's going to be five years. It could be a very long time. Yeah. The last recession, it took us a long time to recover because we didn't get a second stimulus ever. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you're right. Uh, a lot depends on what Congress you're working with and what bills they're willing to pass. We have some questions from folks who are listening to us. And one of them I wanted to pass on to you is, um, from what, from what you can tell, do the impacts on women's poverty and employment in the US during the pandemic vary from state to state or are they pretty consistent across the country? They do vary from state to state. It's partly a result of state policy. For example, we heard a lot about Florida and how difficult it is to get unemployment insurance there. So that's a type of safety net that you know varies from state to state. Uh, at least uh, 20 states, you know, 20 plus states, I believe, have uh, additional earned income tax credits in addition to the federal government. Um, so for those who are able to maintain their employment, they, they will do better in states that have an additional earned income tax credit to the federal government. And some of the states have a higher minimum wage. Uh, so it's, it's definitely the case that the states that, and some of the states have paid family leave. So the states that have a stronger safety net uh, are the ones where the people are, you know, going to do a little better. They also often have high housing costs, of course, uh, and that's always a problem, too. Uh, to just follow up on that, um, uh, a related question is: Do you see big differences across urban versus rural areas? You just uh, you just mentioned that in urban areas you often have high housing costs, but on the other hand, you also have a better social infrastructure for support. Right. Yeah. Um, my understanding is, and uh, you know, that poverty is is um, worse in the rural areas uh, than the urban areas in general. Uh, there are fewer jobs, so you know, getting a strong employment with a good wage is more difficult in a rural area. And this is part of what has attracted people to cities. I mean, very often the people who are looking for high wage jobs, you know, go get an education, want to get a high wage job, they're going to move to cities where the opportunities are. Yeah. So we definitely need more aid and assistance for uh, those in rural areas and, and more economic development there, which I, I think I think Vice President Biden has in mind with some of the um, infrastructure building. Yeah. Yeah. One of our uh, upcoming seminars is going to talk about poverty in place and about um, the, uh, the question of uh, how much do you try and change the circumstances in the place and how much do you focus on helping the person. Um, so, you know, uh, do you, if you have an extremely poor area, do you invest in that area or do you try to get people to leave it? Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's a fairly difficult question and I'm not sure that um, there's room to really discuss it that much here. But it ties into a second question that we had from the audience, which is how does age work into this? Um, is this more of a problem for older women? Um, it's, uh, you know, it's true that in these rural areas, a large part of the problem is often that um, most of the young people have in fact left 
the area mm -hmm. and the people who are left are older. And uh, we mm. know that for older women, the kind of jobs you had during your life and what you earned during your life are gonna be a pretty important factor in uh, what kind of supports you have in your old age. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, how both this whole COVID thing and uh, in general, you know, changes in the way women are able to participate in the labor force and things like that? affect um, poverty in old age? Well, it sounds like, um, I think it looks to me like a disaster that we'll, we'll see play out over the next 10 or 20 years uh, because the women who might have to stop working because of COVID who are in their 50s and 60s may not get another job. Yeah. This is gonna permanently depress their retirement income. And so we're, we may, maybe in a position where we're going to have to increase um, social security benefits, which is our one universal system of retirement. Only about half of workers have anything else other than social security. More have them have, them have savings, so about maybe three quarters have some savings, but it, it could be very little, <laughs> not yeah. enough to last you 20, 30 years of retirement. Uh, so yeah, I, I see that as a problem, but I, I also worry about uh, young people because we have several studies that have shown that the conditions that you meet when you enter the labor market last a good five, 10 years or possibly your whole life. And this one generation that's about you know, 30, 35 now has had two major once in a century events. Uh, first, the great recession of 28, 2008 or so, and um, now this pandemic recession. And uh, I, I really wonder, you know, how they're going to fare over their whole lifetimes. Fortunately, many of them have a safety net, which is moving home with mom and dad. And- A short term <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know. <laughs> but, uh, well, that actually plays into another what question. Say about that, got. Patricia? I didn't quite hear that. Um, that actually speaks to another question we got, um, which was about uh, these young people, not only are they, you know, seeing depressed wages at the start of their career, but they're also very often people with very high student debt. Um, and uh, since at this point in, in history, more women than men are going to, going to school, this is, a, this is a serious problem for a lot of women who are coming out and not being able to get jobs that are gonna allow them to deal with their debt burden over time. Yes, uh, and, even, and even in the last you know, 10 years when the economy was pretty good, women have a higher um, portion of debt relative to their earnings. Um, I think in general, the debt is higher, but also when you compare it to their earnings, it's higher. As a that's chair. Right. As you say, women are um, likely, sorry. So yeah, and again, we're, he we're hearing a lot about debt forgiveness. Well, women are more likely to go to do higher education than men. And um, if they borrow, they borrow a higher share of their income. So they owe, they have a heavier debt burden relative to their income already. That was in the good times. <laughs> yeah. So this is definitely going to be a problem, but we are seeing again a number of political leaders saying that we we need debt forgiveness. Well, you know, it's not going to have to have um, debt forgiveness for existing debt. I'm going to I'm going to try to move to see if I can you get a better can pick up better connection. Um, yeah, and uh, of course, women have a certain tendency to go into those caring professions that you mentioned, where wages are not extremely high. So, but nonetheless, the the qualifications needed are quite high. So, uh, so as you say, that results in very, very substantial debt to income ratios for for these for people in that kind of situation. And I think that is a problem that is kind of a a hidden piece of women's labor force issues at this point. Yes, we have special programs for um, people who go into very essential jobs that do pay less. First, we could pay them more. That would be really great, but yeah. we could do that right away. We could have some special debt forgiveness programs. I mean, it used to be that if you went into teaching, you thought for 10 years, your debt would go away. 
we could do that for your health care, teaching, uh, community service jobs, uh, you know, all the school jobs. So lots of jobs. Yeah. Do you see a role for higher uh, education institutions to, uh, to, to play some important part in this? Or do you think it needs to be more of an external thing? Education is going to have its own problems, right? Uh, yeah. With viability in this situation where uh, students are not going to college right now, um, they're being, colleges feel they have to offer reduced tuition. Um, Many of the public colleges have been getting shrinking uh, revenues from the state government, and that may continue to happen. So I, I think uh, we're going to have to have a major investment in, in higher education, and I think higher education leaders, you know, should be working um, politically, should, should be mobilizing their alumni, their students, their faculty, uh, their investors in the states to say, look, we, we really, you know, yes, we need to, to um, maybe be more forward thinking, you know, maybe vary the types of education we offer, maybe do a lot more virtual learning in the future. Maybe there are a lot of changes that higher education can make, but they also need to really try to flex their political power and, and try to get some um, more resources to really advance education. And by the way, that um, I happen to be more familiar with Vice President Biden's plans than President Trump's plans, but Vice President Biden has made a big deal about uh, investing in science and technology and specifically research at universities. Yeah. Um, another question that one of our um, viewers put in is, how do disparities in women's wages impact child development, particularly in single parent families? Well, I think we're, we're starting to see a lot of evidence uh, in the last five to 10 years, there's been a lot more evidence on, you know, just what economics does to child development and stress and tension are very serious problems for children, not to mention the mothers as well. Mothers and fathers are always worried about, you know, putting food on the table and everything else. Um, so it's a, a huge problem. Uh, I, I think of, um, Greg Duncan, who has a demonstration project now. I don't know, I haven't seen any early results. Maybe you have, uh, Pat. Um, but we, we do know that that economic hardship uh, can retard cognitive development, yeah. emotional development and cognitive development. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we'd really like to see universal early childcare because then um, food is usually made available for low-income people. And schools closing has affected um, children today, getting fewer free meals that they used to get, breakfast and lunch at school. Um, so I, I think it's a, a very serious problem. Uh, and this is why other countries invest more in getting rid of um, poverty, because it's so expensive. Yes. It can be very, very yes. expensive to have so many poor people. You have more health problems. You have more crime. Um, it, it's more cost effective not to let people be so poor. Yeah, one of the things we've talked about earlier in this series is um, how in the United States, the, the only way to really guarantee that you're not gonna be poor is to have a job and to have reasonably good earnings. That there's, there are, I mean, in the United States, self-sufficiency is, is a very, um, you know, it's very much a, Many, many people feel that self-sufficiency is a, a goal in and of itself and that um, that there is something, um, you know, basically wrong with um, offering support to people who are not able to be self-sufficient, even if those people are kids um, and that, you know, there are going to be substantial disincentives to families actually engaging in the workforce, which will hurt them in the long run if, you um, if you do have some of the kinds of social supports that you've been talking about. Um, do you have a response? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you're muted. Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay, now you're on. Nope, still muted. Should accept so is there anyone else who can check out? Well, let me just 
try to mute and unmute. No, nope, you're you're doing okay now. I think I don't know. Maybe you just got too far from the microphone or something. But. Oh, that could be. I might have been too far from the microphone. How's this? Yeah. We're um, doing the one I can think of is the minimum wage. We've done a lot of studies of that. They've been reviewed. We do not show that a higher minimum wage reduces work effort or causes people to lose jobs. I mean, it could reduce work effort, right? And oh, I need to make a thousand dollars. Oh, now I can make that same amount of money in fewer hours, so I'll work less. Or it can reduce the amount of jobs available to you because the employer says, "Oh my God, I got to pay so so you that much. I'm going to hire fewer people." Or fewer hours and we don't see much job loss or reduced work effort from those um i think you know there are countries in which people do do get a better basic living and and out of the government programs and i i don't think they feel they have problems with work effort mm -hmm. i mean if anything if we were to provide more child care we would see more women going to work and and potentially more men as well and potentially um you know, more older people, more young adults who might be doing the child care for prime age workers now. Uh, so it would definitely free up uh, family members to work more. Hawaii has an interesting program where they did exactly that. They created um, a stipend where you could um, get, I think up to $80 a day. It's a cer certain amount of money per day that you can get to do um, elder care in your family so that a prime age woman, a woman from you know 45 to 65, whatever, who might ordinarily be working or want to work, can go out to work. Yeah. Doesn't have to be a woman, could be a man. <laughs> Very good point, Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I see the problem of uh, low wages for women having several different parts and or low incomes for women, low lifetime incomes for women having several different parts. Um, there's structural differences between wages and jobs available to men and women. There's different expectations about who's responsible for non-labor market work. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's uh, uh, the fact that uh, when families split up, when, when uh, parents become single parents, in the great majority of cases, it's the woman who is likely to be primarily responsible for caring for the kids. So those are sort of three intersecting problems that um, that result in lower lifetime earnings and lower lifetime incomes for women in general. Um, and uh, you know, some of those pieces are very amenable to, to solutions like better childcare, um, better social supports. Um, but, you know, the sort of fundamental belief that women are responsible for, um, you know, more or less everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've both been mothers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have to say, I've been very lucky, but yes. But yeah, um, no, and I mean, you know, I, we know that lots of men really do help out, but time use studies do very strongly imply that women are doing a whole lot more hours of work than men if you count both paid and unpaid work. That's uh, no, that that's that's exactly right. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, as a, you know, primarily a labor, a labor, primarily a labor economist, I've always thought that if we could work on the labor market, we would that would push change in the other areas right you know if, if women could earn as much as men on average um, this would push toward more equitable sharing at home uh, and all those other tasks um, and we haven't gotten there yet so yeah. it remains to be seen if it could still happen but i but i think um you know if you look at the us in a way uh we have done better in that sphere than we have done in um, really supporting child care and elder care and paid family leave. I mean, we compared to other countries, we're really way behind on the family subsidy, family care issues. And it does seem that those family care subsidies do also change um, men's behavior. It isn't, it isn't just their wives making more and, you know, pushing them, to, pushing men to do more at home. It's that when you get paid family leave and you take it, 
and you spend that time with your kid, the studies show that that guy spends more time with his kid for the next 20 years. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And All so right. Other countries are getting the benefit of that and we're not. Yeah. We're getting close to being out of time, but um, I was wondering if you had any sort of final comments that you'd like to wrap up with. I liked your summary of the structural uh, issues in employment, the structural issues in unpaid work. And uh, the last one was, I guess, the lack of public supports. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that's um, a really, you know, a really great way uh, to look at it. I think they're also, I, I see architects getting into the act with um, thinking about ways to design buildings that will make us more pandemic proof in the future. And I think that we could have more design options that, um, you know, in a way move toward um, the collective living and collective supports. Uh, does every family need to make its own dinner? Uh, yeah. There's That's, a lot we could be doing. Even though individualistic, the, uh, the sort of um, philosophy of Americans tends to be that seems to be a fairly hard sell for many of them. That's uh... yeah, but it may be because they don't know anything different, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you know, we start when there were uh, we started hearing about how lots of millennials might prefer to live in more dorm-like apartment buildings yeah. uh, where they could share meals. Um, it, it is more efficient, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to either be able to take out or eat in a larger group. Yeah. So we could have some uh, changes in our physical living environment to make it easier to. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, well, one other sort of structural change that you could imagine occurring as uh, partly as a result of this uh, crisis is that um, you're just going to see lower birth rates. So oh, yeah. um, fewer women are going to choose to have have children in a, an environment where there's this kind of uncertainty. That's, uh, oh, that's right. We. The birth rate was already pretty low, and I mean, had been falling before the epidemic, uh, pandemic, and it's way down now, is it not? Yep. I believe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, the... that definitely makes sense. It's not exactly with this much uncertainty. It's not ex exactly the kind of thing you want to do, and you have health concerns too for having a baby now that you very much had so. before the pandemic. So. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, we don't want to add on a, end on a sad note. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that um, I, I think a, a reporter had called and said, you know, she was interested in knowing about women voting. And, you know, the one thing I would say about it is that we're seeing a lot more enthusiasm about voting in general from everyone. Uh, but women have often been the uh, bedrock of the volunteer support, uh, I think, for all political parties and, and all actually all nonprofit organizations. They're the majority of members in environment and civil rights and free speech and everything. Um, and uh, so, you know, women are very civically engaged. Um, they they're, have the potential to make a great deal of change and their votes uh, really matter. So I think, you know, we have seen a political mobilization of women um, through the last couple of elections, um, the Me Too, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. So I, I think we, we are also you know, at, at a, a new high point in mobilization. So we may see some very progressive changes in the next few years. That's a really interesting point. We've seen um, increasing divergence in uh, political views between men and women over the last couple of decades. And a lot of that does seem to be associated with women's concerns about their caring roles and uh, about the needs for social support. So uh, as you say, this pandemic is, if anything, just exacerbating that, not to mention other political factors. Well, I, I think that's right. I think women are, are looking um, for their votes to bring better health care, uh, better education, more family care supports. And I, and I think they've, they've been looking for that uh, for a while. Yeah. Well, Heidi, this has been great. It's been really interesting. And uh, I was so glad you could join us. Well, it was my pleasure. And, uh, great to see you. And uh, hi to everyone else. That, that okay. yeah, and, and Jamie sends greetings. He's uh, sorry he's on the road. <laughs>
<laughs> all right. And you'll have a great election. We'll all be tuned to see what Texas does on Tuesday night. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Yeah.